Hi, Jane. Thank you for coming tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. We don't, uh, authors don't get out much these days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, this is pretty, this is the highlight of my week. Oh, well, awesome. Well, that is, it's a, definitely a highlight of our month to have you. You've been one of, we were so grateful to have you join us for uh, Readers and Ritas in November, and it's wonderful to be able to have some follow-up questions with you now. Thank you. That was a fun event. Oh, it was so much fun. So what have you been up to? Um, how were the holidays for you? How have you been holding up with the, um, I know there was a huge windstorm that hit Seattle. Did you guys lose power during that time? No, but we're right downtown, so everything, all the cables, all the, everything that, all the infrastructure's underground, so we're, it's not like being out in the, in the neighborhoods where the trees are, so power, power was fine. That's good, that's good, yeah. My friend lost it for a day, and I felt so bad for her, but. Oh, it's miserable, it's a miserable, it's, you realize suddenly how, <laughs> how much you rely on it once it's mm -hmm. gone. Wow. <laughs> Um, well, so All the Colors of the Night is a new book that you've got in your uh, Fog Lake series, a second in the series. Um, but I'm so interested because you have a common character in there um, from previous books, Harmony. Can you talk a little bit about creating your survivalist and how she's so kind of kooky and how you came up with that character? Well, Harmony, um, as we find out at some point in this <laughs> story, is actually a Jones. So that explains a lot of her her eccentricities. Um, she is the librarian of Fog Lake, but she is also an oracle. So she's suddenly given to suddenly issuing or, or stating grand warnings, predictions, um, and she has no idea what they mean because oracles are just a pass through. They, she doesn't know where they come from or what they mean. And so she is, um, prone to walk into a room and suddenly make a, a grand announcement about a big storm coming. Um, but she she started out as one of those minor small characters. It was just kind of a side character. And then I realized more and more she became part of the heart and soul of the story. And so she will be in the third book too because she is the keeper of the secrets of Fog Lake. And mm. that puts her into a position of she can find stuff because she's a librarian. <laughs> she's a like library and she knows where the secrets are buried. Not only is she, you know, I love the, the uh, translatable secret superpower of being a librarian is like, you know, <laughs> having the key to knowledge for sure. <laughs> well, that probably, uh, there's a, probably a reason why I went in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a former librarian myself, so. What type of, um, what sort of librarian were you? I worked mostly university and corporate libraries for the most part. Mm -hmm. I spent one year in a uh, grade school library and decided that was not, not my calling. <laughs> oh, no, it didn't work out for you. <laughs> uh, it gave me an enormous respect for teachers, real teachers, the ones for whom it is a calling. And they just have, they have the gift as a talent. I'm all for paying them CEO salaries and getting the best because <laughs> and that's the best thing we could do for the next generation is those gifted teachers. Absolutely. Totally agree. For sure. Um, well, going back to, you know, creating psychics and, and having oracles and just the, all the paranormal elements that are involved with your stories, what sparked your interest in um, including psychic elements in your fiction? Well, I've always had a psychic vibe in my work. Mm -hmm. Not every single book, but if you look back, even toward the beginning of my career, I've always tried to insert it, even when editors didn't want it, because right. I just like to, I like to work with that vibe because I think it gives a, a sense of the bond that creates between the hero and the heroine, um, that is creating between the hero and the heroine. I should emphasize that although my books get often categorized as paranormal, I don't do the supernatural stuff. I don't do vampires, werewolves, um, witches, that mm -hmm. kind of occult stuff. Um, this is all psychic stuff. Yeah. And I like it. And I think it works for a lot of readers because it's just one step beyond intuition. It's mm -hmm. not asking people to buy into a whole um, mythical um, um, universe of, of paranormal, which is another kind of story, I think. But the psychic thing is, like I said, for most people, they can enjoy the fantasy because they can see it as just one step beyond 
intuition and we've all got some version of that. Yeah, it's like magical realism, you know, it's just that sort of energy that uh, makes it so interesting. So were, do you feel like you have your own psychic energy? Are you in tune in, in that sort of way as, uh, yourself? Yeah. Not really. Um, not, more so than anybody, not more so than anybody else thinks. I think, I think probably we don't pay enough attention to our sense of the energy in other people, you know, whether it's good or bad or whether we should be hanging out with that person. You know, sometimes we tend to squelch that either because we're trying to be polite or between, because we don't trust our own intuition. I think that's often. Um, but I can certainly look back in the past and seem too many times when I should have paid attention, you know, I just should have paid attention, but trying to, but we don't really trust it that much. I think a lot of people don't trust it that much. So they make, I guess, I guess I'm saying we should pay more attention to it, not necessarily take this right or wrong, but look at why we're reacting that way. You know, what is it about the energy mm -hmm. of that person or that situation that's bothering us and then mm -hmm. try to analyze it. But I will say that when it, when it came to, researching this book with the core of the story which the story arc goes over three books it's a trilogy yeah mm -hmm. and um the first book is the vanishing and this is book two and the the core of the story are is the fallout decades later from secret paranormal experiments that were being conducted back in the 50s and 60s by the u.s government mm -hmm. and when you open the door on that particular closet the research just goes tumbling out because we did so much of it we it's 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 a fascinating history about how people how the government they poured billions into this stuff yeah for like 20 30 years i mean this was not an overnight event ci was heavily involved duke university was involved stanford was involved i mean this was a major legitimate in their view uh, line of research and it was all because we wanted spies that could see you over the hill <laughs> without having to go there um, and kinds of weapons that could be used and not involve regular technology and that's where all the money went that's <laughs> you're wondering what happened to the budget back in the 50s and 60s that's where it went um, but the main fear was that the old USSR which is now of course Russia was they were also doing the same kind of research and the fear was they'd get ahead of us. So it was the usual, gotta, gotta keep up with the other guys kind of mm -hmm. thing that drove it. It works with but eugenics. Basically, didn't have to invent anything. It was all right there. It was all right there. <laughs> what were some of the stories that you found in your research? Oh gosh, um, well, there was, a. There was a lot of emphasis on using it as a spy weapon, spy tool. The, the, the weapons research thing, I think, because that was technological and they couldn't get anywhere really because they had no way to figure it out. But there's enough of a woo woo factor about every human being mm -hmm. <laughs> that that they could believe that there were people who had the ability to see things based on something they were holding in their hand, something that was happening a thousand miles away. Um, the classic stories of um, psychics who claim to be able to find the body, you know, that's, a, been, a stand, that's been a standard trope in, um, in detective fiction for years, you know, and it's in real life. Um, I read an article today, yesterday, about how many people were going to psychics and fortune tellers this year, oh. you know, under the, under the stress of the year. Yeah, the business. The business was booming. <laughs> so Americans still play with that. I mean, this this article was pretty eye opening about how many people are going to psychics and fortune tellers. So it's not like you can say you don't buy that stuff. You're willing to mm -hmm. spend money on it. You're <laughs> right. It's like it's like uh, the amount of crystals that people are getting for Christmas. You know, just. <laughs> any sort of thing that we can grasp onto to explain the things that are unexplainable. Yeah, and I think I think what we're really looking for is a way to uh, brighten our own energy a little bit, you know, brighten our own mood and our own sense of optimism and, and that kind of thing can do it for yeah, some people. For, for sure.
for sure. Well, and with, um, so all the colors and that you said is the second in the series. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect in the book? Well, this is a case where, where the, the characters in the book are now th three or four generations down. These are the offspring of the town that was ultimately uh, the, the victim, I guess you would say, of the um, psychic uh, research that went awry. There was a, a huge explosion, fog draped over the town for a couple of days and when the citizens woke up, this is back in the 50s and 60s. It, but I, I kind of used 1960s as my turning point. Um, everybody discovered that things had changed, they had changed. Mm -hmm. And now we're dealing with their descendants and they, it turned out the change went straight to the DNA level. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. so the, and so the descendants all have, um, they're struggling with unique talents too. And in amongst all this, there are the bad guys that also got psychic talents. And so it takes, the, the feeling is it takes a monster to hunt a monster. So hunting the monsters is one of the underlying problems that the, this generation faces. So in this particular case, um, our hero's father has been put into a strange waking coma by a strange artifact that was used as a weapon. Mm -hmm. And they've got hours, a couple of days really to find the artifact and try to reverse the process. So that's, that's the plot point. The, the issues between them are that he's, he's from the clandestine foundation, which um, handles trouble in this world, in this mm -hmm. under, underworld. And she's one of the people who works in the underworld. That's how she makes her living, hustling artifacts, <laughs> broker, <laughs> brokering artifacts. So there's a real trust issue right off the bat. She doesn't know if he's gonna try to arrest her and he doesn't know if he can trust her. I think it's fair to say that almost all my books deal with two things. One is issues of trust, because I think it's pretty much the biggest risk every human being takes. You know, you're, when you think about it, every time you trust something or someone, you've taken a risk. Yeah. But the other thing I always like to deal with, my characters are always in the process of reinventing themselves. Something has gone horribly awry in their lives and they're trying to recover from it and get back on track. Those are the two themes I work with. That's, those are my, that's part of my core story. And in this case, um, the characters are trying to, my, one, my hero is losing his psychic talent and he feels he's gonna be useless as a monster hunter in the, in the future. Um, my heroine has taken the fall for a antiquity scam that uh, left her reputation in the normal world, Entire ripped to shreds. So now yeah. she's working in the underworld. <laughs> I think that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Cause I was actually, my next question was gonna be for you um, or for you is what your favorite tropes are to write. And it sounds like, you know, redemption definitely has a major theme and, and runs throughout the stories. I think that's actually a pretty common theme in a lot of books. Mm -hmm. um, why else would we be interested in the characters if they weren't trying to reinvent themselves mm -hmm. or recovering from something yeah. or trying to redeem themselves? Yeah. I think it's just one of the part of the heart and soul of fiction. Yeah, for sure. Just watching that kind of drama. Um, what, so now I have, we're going to transition into our, uh, just some one-off rapid fire questions, just kind of answer them how you feel. Um, so up first is what is your favorite trope to read? Um, I like, I like romantics. I like a situation in which the hero and heroine have to learn to trust each other and work together in order to survive. In a way, it's a kind of a version of the classic marriage of convenience. Mm -hmm. If you look back at historicals, where two people are thrown together and they have no choice but to make it work. I take it the next step, which is they have no choice but to make it work to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and add that, always add that little extra element in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Raise those stakes. All right, well, what trope do you never want to read again? 
You know, I'll take anything if it's well done. Um, <laughs> but I, the one trope I do not like is torn between two men or torn between two lovers. Mm -hmm. No love triangles, huh? Not if, not if our heroine is seriously attracted in both directions, no. <laughs> um, it is too painful, I, that's true. Yeah, it's too painful. For, somebody's going to get hurt. So, badly. Oh, mm -hmm. And you can't do anything about it. Who was your uh, first book boyfriend or girlfriend? Nancy Drew. Awesome. Does that count? <laughs> it count for girlfriend. sure. <laughs> yeah. Girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Nancy um, Drew, probably I owe my entire career to the inspiration from Nancy Drew. I, 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 I was exposed to her, the classics, so they were exposed to me, I guess it would be more, more accurate to say. But when it came to spending my hard earned allowance, that went to Nancy Drew. It went to Nancy. Oh, that's so funny. Do you remember your first Nancy Drew book? No, but it, I, can't re I can't remember now. I just remember it was probably with the, one of the one with the clock. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. was one of the earliest of that. I, it's iconic. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite writing fuel? Well, like everybody else, coffee, I guess. Do you take your coffee spe any special way? No, just black. Nice. Um, with whom would you want to be stuck in an elevator? <laughs> the question is, who would want to be stuck in an elevator with me? <laughs> <laughs> because... I would be in a state of raw panic and it really, really? wouldn't matter. <laughs> a little claustrophobic. I'm very, I'm very claustrophobic. So it would, you don't want to be stuck in an elevator with me. And for your <laughs> sake, I wouldn't want to be with you either. So maybe it would be um, Keanu Reeves's character from Speed so he could get you out of that elevator yeah, quickly. That would, be, that would be the right choice. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So if you were stuck in an era, what era would you be, would you like to be stuck in? Right now, right now, I, I write about the past, but I don't want to go back and live there. So, I, 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 want to, I well, and it's just, I want to see what the future holds. If you're in the past, you already know what happened. So I'm, I'm interested in the future. Yeah. Nice. Although right, I, you... I, I, there are past areas where the clothes were better. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> what is your preferred era for fashion? Well, I'm doing, uh, as Amanda Quick, I'm writing in the 1930s now, and um, the, I find the clothes situation there very interesting because we have the glamorous evening gowns from the movies, mm -hmm. and they were real. I mean, those, those gowns. But the day wear, women's day wear, is um, oddly um, almost, almost dowdy by, to, our, to our eyes today. Um, house dresses, um, mm -hmm. I, but maybe that's because I think of them as something my mother might have worn. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how much of that's psychological, but um, but the glamour clothes um, were hard to beat. Yeah, yeah, so beautiful. And I do like a nice house dress though. It's always very comfortable, airy when you need it. There was a reason they invented them, yeah. <laughs> are you a pantser or are you a plotter? Um, Pretty much a pantser but I start out kind of knowing where I'm going for the first three chapters or so and then after that I have a vague idea of where the book is going but I don't pin myself down with a detailed synopsis and the reason I don't do that is because I've learned the hard way that I'll never stick to it <laughs> you know 40 pages in and everything's changing on me and I think that's partly because um, I'm a dialogue driven writer mm -hmm. and once I start writing dialogue the characters start talking I get ideas from them that I didn't have until they started talking. It, it, it kind of feeds off the dialogue and they'll talk themselves into a situation I did not see coming. And that happens over and over and over again. So that's why I don't try to pin it down to. I mean, it would be very comforting to get up every morning and know exactly where I was going to write today. Um, and I do know that on the second and third drafts, mm -hmm. but on that first draft, it's, it's, it's wide open. Okay. That, that said, I think it's fair to say that if you read a lot of my books, you know that I have my kind of characters and you're either going to respond to those characters or not. This mm -hmm. is what I do. And my characters reflect my own core values. I can't not do that. Um, they, they reflect my worldview, which is fundamentally optimistic. Um, 
I don't, um, so, so in a sense, they have my sense of right and wrong, mm -hmm. sense of what's honor and dishonorable and that kind of, you know, so they're always going to have that. And I think that if those core values and, and feelings resonate with your own, you'll enjoy the books. And if they don't for on some, in some way, shape or form, um, you'll, you won't pick my books up again. And I think that's true of a lot of most every writer really. Yeah. You, yeah. If you go back over and over again, it isn't just because they're telling a story the way you want to hear it, but because there's something in the story that speaks to you. Yeah, that really resonates. Yeah. Did you get a lot of pushback from editors with that sort of like dedication to to, um, to creating that sort of a character? No, not really. Editors that I've encountered um, don't squash that kind of thing. Uh, I think they just wouldn't buy the book if they thought you, if they didn't like your characters. I mean, I've certainly had a lot of rejections in my life. <laughs> and I assume that's partly because they didn't like the characters. So in that sense, you know, because editors are readers too. And mm -hmm. they don't risk, they don't actually, they don't love everything they read either. Um, what is a what is your favorite book to recommend to um, a new romantic suspense reader? Romantic suspense. Um, well, but the, there's a my friend Christina Dodd has written a lot of great romantic suspense, and uh, that this the current one is Wrong Alibi, which is actually I shouldn't have picked it up because it's not. So much of romance this is straight woman in jeopardy suspense mm -hmm. um, but her style when she does romantic suspense is um, a very good introductory introductory area i'm always on the lookout for new romantic suspense writers um rachel grant i like a lot mm -hmm. rachel grant does she is a uh, um, archaeologist and a lot of, well, all of her books feature an archeologist in some form or another and the plot spins out of contemporary archeology. span And uh, I, like, I like all that. It kind of reminds me of the old Amelia Peabody books, but mm -hmm. it's contemporary, not set in the 19th century. So I would suggest Rachel Grant would be a, a good starting point. And everything has, you learn something as well as she writes very steamy romance. She she has a knack for being able to, the, the thing that makes, I should back up and say, the thing that makes romantic suspense different from say woman in jeopardy suspense or straight romance mm -hmm. is because every twist in the romance has to evoke a twist in the suspense and vice versa. Each has to work like lockstep to move the plot along. And not everybody can plot that well. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, well, it's your either your natural story or it's not. If it's not, you're going to know it because you'll feel like it's, it'll be, it'll be, um, but it, what's the word? Chunky. It'll be all chunked up and you mm -hmm. won't have a sense of flow. The yeah. flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which would probably mean it's not your story to tell, find something else to write. But, um, but for those of us who write romantic suspense, the suspense and the romance are somehow just intertwined in a way we can't really explain but one thing always changes the other and you and both things get resolved at about the end of the book at, a, at around the same time do you still find the joy in writing romantic suspenses after you know such a storied career yeah i do i i wouldn't do it if i didn't i love it yeah. and um, but one of the things that's made it possible i think for me to stay in love with, with the writing and to still feel the passion of the writing is because although it was not the plan at the start, <laughs> I wound up with three worlds. I wound up with my Amanda Quick world, I wound up with my Jane Castle world, and I wound up with my Jane Ann Krentz world. And that, I never intended that. And for those of you who are aspiring writers, I do not recommend it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to promote three names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people who read me as Amanda Quick often do not read me as Jane Ann Krentz or Jane Castle and vice versa. They don't read me. They may just want the Jane Castle books. They don't want the Amanda Quick books. So in, in essence, what I ended up with was three careers. Yeah. And, and that's not the smartest business decision in the world, I will just tell you. I would highly recommend sticking with one name, even if you move around 
within your own universe. And I do think the way to think about this is you're going to have a core story. That core story is not going to change fundamentally much, no matter how long you write, because it has nothing to do with the landscape, the fictional landscapes that you choose. It has everything to do with the kind of, of conflicts and emotional drama that you like to work with. And the beauty of knowing that going in is that you don't feel when, when the market turns on you and all of a sudden paranormal isn't selling anymore, you can take that core story anywhere because it's universal because the human emotions and the conflicts are universal. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to find another place in your writing universe where that, where that can fit. But, um, but I would say, I think, I think you're going to spend, spend your whole career exploring your own writing universe and you still won't find the end of it. It's a vast thing. It's a vast thing. Do you give each of your, uh, your author names, like a different personality? Do they have like their own sort of imaginable? Nope. Yeah. When I go in from, I really like moving from one world into the other. I think that refreshes me, but it doesn't mm -hmm. change me. It just gives me new plot ideas and new, new situations and, and, uh, a whole different vibe to work with. But um, but if you like the characters in Amanda Quick, you're gonna like the characters in Jane Castle and mm -hmm. Jane and Krenz. And if you don't like them, you won't. <laughs> That's just kind of how it works. Um, and a question that we get asked a lot to ask authors is, um, what does your writing day look like? Oh, yeah, everybody's interested in process. And I do mm -hmm. understand that because I'm interested in other people. We just wanna know about your pajamas, <laughs> how you take your coffee. Like we want to be the fly on the wall as you create. <laughs> oh, well, it's, um, I'm basically a morning person. So most of the creative work, whatever creative work I'm going to be able to accomplish, it's going to happen in the mornings. That's my high, that's when my energy level's highest, mm -hmm. maybe because of the coffee. <laughs> um, but I've just always been a morning person. So by noon, I'm, I'm probably not going to be into a totally can't stop writing mode, you know, by noon, I'm going to be looking more about double checking the research, going back and verifying the character's uh, background, um, doing some, going back and rewriting a scene that I now realize needed to be ended differently. Um, and that's, I think of that as afternoon work. And morning work is just start writing and don't stop until it stops. Yeah. But I also took when I left the library world, I took those habits with me, those work, ha work habits with me. Um, so I'm a, I think, well, I think it's fair to say I'm a, I'm a very disciplined writer. I do mm -hmm. write virtually every day. And if I'm not writing every day, I'm making notes or I'm doing research or I'm doing something that will, because like once I'm into a book, I become obsessed with it and I can't stop thinking about it until it's done. Mm -hmm kind of takes over my life. Do you feel like your process has changed at all in the last year with pandemic? I know writers, you know, we work from home all the time already, but like, do you feel like your energy or your vibe is a little bit different? Using vibe is a great word, a little bit different this year. Yeah, because my afternoons are when I used to go shopping and do the groceries shopping mm -hmm. and I love to grocery shop. I love to browse up and down the aisles. And look I miss grocery food. shopping too. <laughs> Just like sitting there and smelling, I miss smelling candles. <laughs> my own vegetables. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, and I love Nordstrom's and I, you know, I think of that as retail therapy. Um, that's when I used to do the exercise, you know, what, ex that's when I got my exercise, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of, all of a sudden I'm in the afternoons and it's like, now what, you know, I can't go do any of this stuff. So that's been, that's probably been the hardest thing. And then I think it makes you realize, even though writers all say, well, I'm an introvert. I don't, I don't socialize much. The truth is we socialize a lot more than we realize when it was mm -hmm. suddenly cut out. Yeah. We no longer could do it. Then you realize, Oh, I really do need other people. Thank gosh for zoom. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what we would have done without it. I know it's been, it's one of our favorite things is that we've been able to, for the last year, have these weekly book clubs and meet people from all over the country and just stay connected when we feel so disconnected because of circumstances. I think that's going to continue on. I don't see this going away. Um, even when things return to normal, I think 
for example, writers' organizations, um, local writers' organizations, rarely went national. There were a few national writers' organizations, but most of the, if you were, if you went to the library and asked what your local writers' groups were, they were kind of small organizations scattered around the town, and and that's where you found your people. You know, the people mm -hmm. that you felt comfortable with as a writer. Um, but now those organizations are able to go national too. So I think. I think we're going to see more of an expansion of this kind of, of um, groups and, and people socializing across country in, a, in an interesting way like this. Yeah, for sure. I think people are so much more open to it and so much more comfortable now with it as well. And it opens the door for way, like, um, ways that a lot of people who weren't able to can now attend things. So yeah, it's, very, exactly. it's much more inclusive. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Jane, um, I want to make sure our readers have a chance to ask you some questions. So before we sign off of our official interview portion, can you let readers know how they can stay in touch with you and learn to, uh, and learn more about you? Well, I am online and my home on the web is my website, which is janeandkrentz.com. And I also have Facebook, which is Facebook slash whatever, Jane and Krentz. Um, I have a presence on Instagram, but frankly, I suck at Instagram, so <laughs> don't expect it's to find It's a talent. Me. It takes a real skill and a real like amount of time. <laughs> I think it's the time. I just don't have the time for it, but um, I do try to keep, I try to keep pictures up, but I haven't figured out how to do this, the reels and the stories and I, uh, yeah, so I'm not too active there. So mostly it's going to be Facebook and, uh, and my website which is where you can find a whole list of my books sorted by series. So point that out. Great. Well, Jane Ann Krenz, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions off record. Uh, so just tune in for that. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Had a great time. <laughs>